Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining Diventures today for episode eight of our Oceans Update webinar series, Why Sharks Are Special. If you haven't tuned in before, my name is Sabrina Severin, and I am the Ocean Health Education and Conservation Coordinator here at Diventures. I'm excited to introduce you today to our host, Dr. Alex Brolsky. And for those who have tuned in before, this might sound a little familiar. Dr. Alex Brolsky is the founder of Ocean Education International, a consulting firm focusing on environmental education and professional development for the marine tourism industry, specializing in the recreational scuba sector. He is currently the director of education at Reef Smart and is also the author of The Complete Diver and Beneath the Blue Planet, which can both be purchased at your local dive ventures. Dr. Brilski holds a Master of Arts in Instructional Systems Design, a Master of Science in Marine Biology and Coastal Zone Management, and an EDS and PhD in Science Education with a technical specialty in oceanography. He has a unique and diverse background that combines education and marine conservation, and we're honored to share this knowledge and passion with you today. I hope you enjoy this webinar and the important information shared by Dr. Brilski. Take it away. Thanks, Sabrina. Well, welcome back for those of you who are coming to uh, the webinar and welcome to those who are new. Uh, what I wanted to do uh, this time was re revisit the topic of sharks. Now, uh, some of you may remember a few months ago, we did a, a presentation uh, sec segment on what I, what I call the human shark inter uh, equation. And uh, we did not really talk a lot about the critters themselves. And that's what I really want to get at today. Uh, and I thought in, in addition, if I can get my slides to change here. Uh, okay, there we go. I, I thought I would, uh, in the in the news segment, as we always do, I, I, th I thought I would uh, look at sharks as well and found three very interesting uh, news articles. Uh, that'll be a good segue into our main topic today. And the travel log, I'm going to go to a rather unusual location, and that's the Galapagos Islands. So without any further ado, let's let's jump in and take a look at uh, the issue. If you've ever seen uh, Shark Week or any video, you've probably seen great white sharks. And the chances are those those images were taken off South Africa, uh, off the South African coast in one of two locations, as you see from the uh, the bottom there, either False Bay or Gunsby. And for decades, these have had shark populations uh, that virtually guaranteed encounters. Uh, but several months ago, if not longer, the, the sharks, the white sharks began to disappear. And that was of great concern, both ecologically and economically, because of the, of the dependence on shark ecotourism there. And there was speculation that it may be a result of, uh, of fishing pressures, whatever. But then uh, some interesting things began to happen, as you're going to see here in this video. And this is a pod of orca uh, hunting, predating a great white shark. And you'll see uh, they're quite successful in this regard. And over time, there were several, more than a dozen of these encounters, or rather not these encounters, but uh, dead uh, white sharks washing up on the beach with this very obvious wound whereby their livers were removed. Now, the livers in sharks, as we'll talk about, are 30% of their mass, and they're highly desirable uh, by these orca. And so this was happening and recently, uh, a paper was published that kind of documented that indeed the white sharks weren't be eaten, weren't eaten, but rather they were literally scared off. And in fact, uh, they seem to have reappeared the populations further east in this area called Angoa Bay. And I wanted to just kind of bring that to the attention because behavioral ecologists call this a result of the what we call the landscape of fear. In other words, not only is competition important in terms of what predators take out of the system, but it's also important in terms of how they alter behavior. This was uh, discovered and researched pretty thoroughly after the introduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park in the 1990s. 
And so here we have another example of how top level predators are really altering the ecology uh, and the behavior of ecosystems. Now, back at False Bay and Gunspy, the niche has been filled, and it's been filled primarily by these two species, the seven gill, which has been uh, video, uh, videoed uh, predating uh, seals, and uh, as well as the bronze whaler. And so there's, their ecotourism industry is beginning to shift to these organisms, and probably will uh, white shark tourism will increase further east. Switching to the other side of the world, off of Raja Ampat, which is the most biodiverse region of the entire world ocean, there was an uh, there's was an interesting little uh, tidbit of news. Uh, what you see there, these zebra sharks uh, have almost been completely extirpated from the environment, and this is an example of kind of working in the reverse. And what's happening now you know, are these zebra sharks are being bred in captivity at various aquaria around the United States and, and elsewhere, and then being reintroduced back into the environment there in Raja Ampat. And the article uh, goes on to explain uh, how that's working and to what degree of success uh, they've had. Uh, by the way, before I, I, I hadn't mentioned that all of these uh, news stories are uh, available as a, from, from links uh, from the uh, uh, the webinar website, by the way, so you can get into the details. Uh, and then, lastly, an interesting article that that cropped up was the sinking of this inflatable uh, catamaran, which was on a wor uh, a, a round the world journey, and it was attacked in the Coral Sea off Australia uh, by a little known little critter called a cookie cutter shark. And you see there in the image, uh, someone holding one uh, it has an enormous mouth with rather ravenous teeth. And uh, the, this was the second time, by the way, this expedition uh, uh, encountered these, uh, these little critters. And you see on the lower left, the kind of uh, classic uh, bite that they uh, cr uh, create. They, pr they predate at night, uh, uh, on large, typically marine mammals. And in fact, there's been at least one instance where one <laughs> human being in an overnight swim from Oahu to Maui uh, was attacked, he, he survived, but this is, this is the chunk, this is the wound of the, uh, the chunk of uh, flesh taken out of his uh, lower leg. So it goes on to uh, show just how diverse sharks are. Which, of course, brings us to the main topic here. So let's talk about the critters themselves. Sharks have been around a long time, a long time. In fact, they've been around for uh, over 420 million years. As perspective, sharks existed before trees. They existed before dinosaurs. They existed before the rings of Saturn formed. So they've had a long time to kind of refine their niche in the ocean. The other thing is that they've been quite hardy. We know that there have been five major mass global extinctions of, of uh, organisms on Earth. Sharks have come through all of them. In fact, they came through another, what we might call mini uh, mass extinction about 19 million years ago, which seemingly only affected uh, them. Uh, anyway, the upshot is there are 34,000 species of bony fish, but there are only about 530 described species of sharks. Uh, and yet they have survived this long. And one of the reasons is their diversity. First, when you think of a shark, we tend to think of jaws or something that looks sharky. But when you take into consideration of all those sharks, more than half of them will live below 500 feet. So we will never see them as scuba divers. Uh, and more than half of them only grow to the length of about a meter. And they occupy, as you see on the right there, virtually every marine ecosystem from the near surface to the deep ocean. So they've been quite adept. And given the fact that there aren't that many species, this is pretty remarkable. 
So why is why they've been so successful? As you probably know, all sharks are cartilaginous. They do not have bone. And I think from our biased perspective, having bones, we think, well, that's a disadvantage. To the contrary, this is an advantage. And you see the reasons here. Bone is a lot lighter, so less buoyancy issues, less, less negative buoyancy. It's also much more flexible. Uh, but probably most importantly is the way that the muscles in the sharks connect. Our muscles, of course, connect to our bones. Sharks don't have bones. But they have an internal collagen casing almost, like a sausage, uh, that allows the muscles to connect directly to this exo, uh, <laughs> exotendon, as it's referred to. Uh, it's a lot like with, uh, with, in, with uh, uh, arthropods or crustaceans. Their exoskeleton allows for attachment of their muscles, giving them extremely good purchase and power. That's why a tiny little crab can pinch so hard. In a similar way, this happens with sharks. And if you look at the construction, you see in the, the color image there under a, micro, uh, under a microscope, these collagen fibers fit together uh, in that cross pattern. And when they are bent in one direction, they actually uh, develop potential energy because of their elasticity. I I'm reminded when I was a kid, we had these Chinese uh, uh, handcuffs, we call them, uh, that were, uh, if you put your fingers in and then pull them apart, your fingers kind of got stuck in the process. And it's kind of that kind of a construction that helps them uh, not only be more flexible, which is a, an advantage to a, to a predator, uh, but also helps them to get much more energy uh, from their muscular uh, uh, movement. The other thing, if you've ever uh, fished and you've caught a fish and decided to eat it, uh, you probably scaled it by you know running a knife opposite the direction of the scales. You can't do it that with a shark because sharks don't have the same kind of scales. Sharks' scales are literally tiny little teeth. They're in fact they're called dermodenticles. The derma, dermodenticles, and you see in the upper right there, uh, they are attached to the skin and even have a blood supply, much like our own teeth. And this disrupts the water flow, reducing the drag. And you think, well, how could a rough surface reduce the drag? Well, you would think a golf ball to go the greatest distance should be totally smooth. It's not. It's dimpled. And by disrupting that surface, you actually can increase the aerodynamics uh, as well. And so this is one of the ways, this is one of the reasons sharks are so efficient in their swimming. It's also been shown that this is a way to reduce uh, parasites and even disease. And if you remember from the previous uh, presentation, there is a film being manufactured, used in hospitals and other areas uh, to reduce uh, bacterial uh, uh, bacteria uh, called uh, shark link. And it's based upon this dermal denticle idea. So this is also an important uh, adaptation that only the, the cartilaginous fishes have, the sharks and the rays. Uh, Mother Nature has a use for this. This is a, a, a uh, technique uh, referred to as chafe, uh, chafing. And what these smaller sharks are doing is they're swimming in the opposite rough direction. In other words, if, they, if you run in, in the direction from tail to head, they're using that sandpaper-like uh, structure to rid themselves of parasites. Aside from scales, the jaw of jaws is really critical, has been critical to their, their success. In our jaw, our mandible, our, our jaw bone is connected literally at the temporomandibular, temporomandibular joint. Uh, and so basically it's part of our skull. That's not the case with sharks. As you see in the middle image there, it's connected by a tendon, a, a, a hypomandibular uh, tendon, which means the jaw is literally separated from the skull or what they call the chronocranium. 
Uh, likewise, if you remember, sharks are cartilag cartilaginous, and therefore, you know, if you've seen shark jaws, they don't deteriorate where most of the shark does. The reason the jaws and even the skull don't is that they're calcified with these tiny little structures called tesserae. And that gives a lot more uh, robust structure to the jaw and the uh, 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 this, the uh, skull. Here's the result. The top image shot in an aquarium. You'll see this sand tiger shark in a second here. Bingo, that jaw extension is a huge advantage and enables sharks to eat things that are even bigger than themselves. The champion of this is the goblin shark. You can see that jaw extension uh, is quite remarkable here. So their flexibility, their swimming efficiency, their ability to predate all have been critically important. Now here's the rub. If you don't have bones, then where are the important components of your immune system created? And it turns out that sharks, all elasmobranchs, have an organ that no other vertebrate does. It's called the epigonal organ, as you see here in this necropsy photo. Uh, they all, some sharks also have a, a, a group of tissue in their esophagus called Leydig's organ. And this is responsible for a lot of those immune cells necessary, making their immune system among the very best of any vertebrate. So Mother Nature is pretty tricky. Uh, you may have heard stories of sharks such as tiger sharks with all kinds of things in their stomachs from license plates to uh, antlers. And uh, that that's true, but there's, a, there's an issue here. Now, when a shark consumes something, it of course goes through its digestive tract, but sharks are extremely efficient in their ability to absorb nutrients. Uh, in fact, sharks tend to eat less, what we call da the daily ration, than bony fish. And one of the reasons is th their, the efficiency of their, of, uh, their absorption is explained right here in the intestines in this structure called the spiral valve. Think of a, of a spiral staircase. The food continually swirls around and that contact constantly is able to very efficiently absorb the nutrient. The downside is nothing large can pass through their digestive tract. Uh, so how do they deal with things like bones or license plates? Watch closely here. This is a shark that's being stressed as it's being caught. And watch here, that is not vomit. That is the shark's stomach. Uh, basically, they have essentially evo e evacuated the stomach and therefore the contents, the, the stomach would then be uh, re uh, re uh, taken back in and they go on their merry way. And so, pooey, if uh, sharks do consume things that they cannot digest, they simply get rid of them. Another big difference in sharks is the way that they handle being in salt water. Now, being in salt water is extremely challenging because the of the difference in the uh, in the salts, uh, you know, the various uh, salts that are necessary in our body, uh, for the electrolytes that help tra uh, muscular transmission, etc. Uh, in saltwater fish, you'll see here there is a, a difference. And in fact, this has come up uh, many times because you may have heard, in fact, that, well, sharks pee through their skin. And this gets back to this issue of what we call osmoregulation. Here in bony fish, you'll notice there's a difference that's maintained. The average salinity in the ocean is about 35 parts per thousand, yet the tissues of saltwater fish is about 14 or 15. And so that that, that imbalance between the two is constant and it's physiologically stressing and there has to be a mechanism for that to be maintained. The way it happens, fish are continually drinking water 
Uh, but in order for that to not uh, cause the cells to, to expand, they have to you know, get rid of the salt in the process. Uh, and basically, you know, what you see happening here, you have this imbalance constantly in a process we refer to as osmoregulation. Now look at the image on the lower right, and you see that there is a balance between the water salinity and the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the shark's fluids. And that is done by the sharks retaining urea in their tissues along with another compound called TMAO. And so they maintain this osmotic balance in the process. Uh, and indeed, with most sharks, uh, you will have a very distinct sense of uh, uh, smell of, of urine uh, when you try to uh, 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 butcher them. And in fact, most sharks are not edible for that reason. Some, uh, there's an except, there are exceptions to that. Now, there is a big exception to this whole, this whole imbalance issue because there is a species, the bull shark, that is able to control their internal salinity and live in fresh water. And there are instances of bull sharks living hundreds of miles from the ocean. This one instance, a shark taken in Illinois in the Mississippi River, uh, 1,300 miles from, from the ocean. And so it is, uh, this particular species is able to do this. It's thought it's a uh, an adaptation for uh, females to be able to pup in fresh water where no other sharks can go. And uh, therefore it's a, a mechanism for, to maximize the survival of their, uh, their uh, young. Another more recent example, this is a golf course in Brisbane, Australia. And there was a, a news item recently where uh, th there was a population of uh, bulls, bull sharks that remained in this golf course pond for over 17 years uh, as a result of their, their being put in there during a flood. So it shows you they're quite adaptable. Uh, now bulls, frankly, from my perspective, bulls are one of the three sharks that have been responsible for most, uh, uh, most incidents on humans. Uh, and and in, in my personal home opinion, it's the shark that I'm, I tend to be most weird, leery of. And there's probably some rationale. They have been shown to have the highest testosterone uh, levels of any vertebrate yet studied. And if you look at the, their, their bite strength per mass, they have the strongest uh, bite strength as well. So uh, bull sharks are kind of special. Another myth you'll often hear about sharks is they have to swim to breathe. Now that's true for many species, but not all. And if you've been on coral reefs, you've seen that uh, nurse sharks, for example, are able to breathe through what's referred to as bu buccal uh, breathing. They're, the buccal muscles of the, are able to manipulate uh, and uh, create water flow. Uh, some sharks can do this, others can't, and there are many that could do they can do both. They can switch from one to the other depending upon circumstance. Uh, shark livers, as, as I said, the uh, the orca are very were only interested in predating the great whites and taking the liver. The reason is it's a massive structure. It's thirty percent of their body weight. It's high in fat, so it's very buoyant, and it's one of the ways sharks do not have gas bladders. Uh, to control their buoyancy, as many bony fish do. Uh, and so that, that very buoyant liver is very important in maintaining their, their uh, uh, buoyancy in the water. You can see that a 1,000-pound a tiger shark is only about 7%, 7 pounds negative in the water. And there's one species, the sand tiger, that actually has been documented, as you see here, gulping air and retaining that air in its stomach as kind of an internal buoyancy compensator. Another thing you may have heard about sharks is that they're quote, warm blooded. Not quite true, uh, but some species, uh, in fact, one whole family, are what are referred to as mesothermic. And what that means is they're utilizing their body function in order to uh, increase their temperature. Now, they don't maintain a constant body temperature as we do, but as you see from the illustration, 
they are able to increase their body temperature substantially. And if they can do that, they can swim better, they can see better, they can their brains can function better, and they become far more efficient predators. The way this is done is by the configuration of the blood vessels in their dark meat, in this what we call slow <clears throat> twitch muscle. Uh, and you kind of see here, in this dark meat under a microscope, the veins in the arteries are aligned contiguously right next to each other. And what that means is these muscles move, the heat generated in that process uh, in the veins as it comes back to the heart crosses next to the cooler blood from the from from the heart they after all they're cold blooded and that warmth from the vein to the artery transfers making them very very efficient now there are a few bony fish uh, uh bill fishes and tuna also have this uh this ability as well but uh the uh the the sharks you see uh, on the list there all have this uh, capability. Of course, teeth are, you know, a, a, a featured uh, uh, element of sharks. You see that uh, they have uh, a very different structure. Bony fish like us have their, their teeth embedded in their jaws. Uh, not so with sharks. The teeth are only attached to the skin in rows. And there is a continuously supply, a continuous supply of these teeth that are uh, either simply uh, fall out or are removed as they're uh, in the process of trying to eat something. Likewise, many species of sharks, all species of sharks, have teeth that are adapted to what they're designed to eat. And so if you simply are catching fish, the sand tigers you see in the middle lower image there is able to grab hold and uh, cut. Whereas if you have uh, the ability to bite through a turtle shell, for example, you need something very different as the tiger shark uh, tooth you see there. And of course, if you're taking big chunks out of marine mammals, you need serrated teeth as the great white shark. Over the course of the, a shark's lifetime, depending on species, they can produce 20 to 40,000 teeth. That's why they're such ubiquitous fossils uh, in uh, uh, the, that we find. Even the shark's tail is adapted differently. Uh, as you may know, if you've caught a bony fish, it looks like the image there in the center, uh, that the, 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 the animal's uh, body essentially terminates and these fins extend with the, with the flesh. A shark's tail, the vertebrae continues up into the upper lobe and there is also a muscle called the radialis that enables it to maintain its its uh, structure as the as the shark moves its uh, changes its tail orientation, uh, increasing its uh, its thrust. Now, likewise, the design of the tail is going to be a function of what the shark needs to do. If you don't need to be up in the water column, you don't need that lower lobe. So you'll see sharks like zebra sharks or uh, Nurse sharks don't have a lower lobe. Uh, the most efficient tail for swimming is this one here, the mako, where it's 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 pretty concentric upper and lower. Uh, and if you take a look over on the right, the image is there. The tiger and the salmon are a good example. The tiger shark uh, predates on a stingrays, turtles basically things that are maneuverable. And so it needs the maneuverability. Whereas the salmon shark is a fish eater and they're simply, their job is simply to chase down fish. And you can see the morphology of the tail uh, is designed to, uh, to do just that. Shark smarts, we've all heard that they're these mindless eating machines. If you look at the little graph there, the, the brain mass body ratio of all the chondrichthians, which is the sharks and the rays, is actually right smack in the middle above the ray fin or the bony fish. And so there really is no reason in terms of their brain size to think that they're somehow less intelligent. Uh, 
And in fact, sharks have been trained uh, to do various tasks, et cetera. But the interesting thing is the sharks, the structure of the shark's brain is remarkably similar to ours, but different areas are emphasized in terms of their lifestyle. The dogfish shark, which is a, a bottom feeder essentially, uh, they swim in schools, they catch fish. Uh, they have highly sensitive uh, olfactory or, or uh, smelling ability. Uh, whereas the hammerhead, which is a much more visually oriented, has a very different uh, structure in its brain. And so it's, it's very much reflected uh, in the brain anatomy as to what the shark, how the shark makes a living. The champion in terms of the brain to body weight of all things is not a shark, but rather a man of right. And uh, they have uh, a, a, a brain that's for body mass 10 times that of a whale shark. In fact, they, they have done uh, mirror experiments as they do with uh, many animals and they seem to see, they seem to have uh, some kind of self-recognition. If you've ever dived with manta rays, you realize there's, there's something kind of special. This, this critter kind of gets it. Likewise, all of the senses in sharks are remarkable. We have five, they have seven. And as you see here, the senses can be really deployed de uh, depending upon distance. Uh, the most distant sensory organ would be hearing uh, because light uh, sound travels so well underwater. Uh, sharks can hear uh, at great distances on orders of, kilo of kilometers, in fact. Uh, smell takes over as uh, the distance closes. Uh, and then the lateral line, which is sometimes described as distant touch, it's basically the ability to detect motion in the water. All fishes have that. Uh, and when you get into the you know range of uh, 100 meters or low, that or less, that can kick in. And then vision can kick in if you have visibility. As the shark gets closer, they then have this other sense that bony fish do not have, and that's the ability to detect electrical signals, as we'll discuss. And then finally, at contact, they have uh, taste buds, not only in, in their mouth, but around the mouth. Vision is uh, quite remarkable. They have a superb vision. Uh, mainly because of a structure that your kitty cat has called a tapetum lucidum, which is kind of a mirror-like structure behind the retina. It's made of guanine uh, crystals. And what it does, as the light goes through the retina, uh, in us, it gets one chance. The photon is either detected or not. But the tapetum, because it's mirror-like, reflects the light back through the retina, giving them incredibly efficient low light uh, capability. Uh, it's the reason your cat's eyes glow at night, in fact. Uh, other things that are important is that they have an iris. Bony fish do not have an iris. And so their visual acuity is increased. Uh, the thing that that is also different with, uh, with sharks and some fish, so far, Color vision, full color vision, tricolor vision has been documented in rays, but not in sharks. So most sharks uh, either do not have cones, so they're completely colorblind. And of the sharks studied, they tend to have green cones. Some have blue, but no, they do not have all three, the red, blue, and green. Uh, that really doesn't matter to a predator because they're not cueing on color. Uh, but... Uh, they are very, very adept at, uh, at vision, to say the least. In fact, it's believed that sharks at night can not only hunt by moonlight, they can probably hunt by starlight. The electrosensitivity is shown through a unique uh, feature of the elasmobranchs or the, the chondrichthyan fishes called the, <laughs> lampere, the ampullae of Lorenzini. These are electrical sensors you see here uh, in the upper image. They, they look like uh, these little, they look like these little pores. 
uh, if you, and obviously not when the shark's alive, but if you squeeze the nose of a dead shark, you'll see jelly pouring out of these pores. And it's it's electric conductive jelly that uh, makes contact with the with the organ itself, as you see in the X-ray image. And these are as sensitive as any commercial voltometer. Uh, they're able to detect, uh, you know, beat, the beat, a beating heart or even the change in current as a fish opens and closes its mouth. So they can easily detect uh, fishes that are submerged in the sand, for example. This, is, this was shot off Tampa a couple years back, well offshore. This is a great white uh, who's come in and he's trying to eat the lower unit of this outboard. This is also, if you're a boater, where the sacrificial zinc is attached. And so it's a highly electrically charged area. Uh, and what's happening, of course, is the Lorenzini uh, uh, ampullae are being activated and it's simply responding to what it could perceive as a prey. It's going into tonic immobility here, by the way, upside down. Now, this may have cost this photographer about $12,000 because <laughs> here a, uh, <laughs> a uh, camera system has interested this tiger to the point where uh, uh, he absconds with the camera. Uh, this guy, I understand, did recover the camera. But the, the electrical signals emanated by strobes, of course, uh, do offer this kind of potential. In fact, the Lorenzini are very, very sensitive, so much so that at least in some species, it's been documented that they can detect electrical anomalies in the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And in some species, particularly the hammerheads, it's probably used as a navigational tool due to anomalies in the Earth's uh, uh, magnetic field. Now, the cephalofoil, as the head of, a, of, of the hammerheads is called, uh, does several things. First of all, it spreads out the Lorenzini. So it has a wide array, array a wide, wide distance in which it can uh, sense. Uh, but it also provides some swimming efficiency. It was once thought that it provided lift as they swim. It's, that's been dis, dis, discredited. Uh, but it does provide lift as they turn. And one of the reasons they're able to predate uh, stingrays, which are very, very uh, agile, is the assistance provided by the cephalophore. So they're pretty interesting critters. The other reason for the hammer is its vision. Uh, as you can see here, we have about a 95 uh, degree, uh, or I'm sorry, a total of about 120 degree uh, uh, range. Uh, and you see with various species of, uh, the, ha of the hammerhead sharks, uh, can almost see 360 degrees due to the uh, uh, positioning of the eyes at the ends of the cephalophore. Finally, sharks do it differently in terms of reproduction. Uh, as you know, bony fish lay eggs. Okay. Sharks lay eggs, of course. They're referred to as oviparous. Uh, and they lay eggs typically not into the water column, but in little egg cases. Sometimes you find them, they're called mermaids' purses on the beach. However, there are sharks <clears throat> that give live birth. And people say, well, only mammals have live birth. No, sharks give <clears throat> have li a li live birth or they are viviparous. And th these are sharks that not only give live birth, but they actually have a placental connection with the fetus. And then there are species that kind of have a, a middle ground where they lay eggs, quote unquote, internally. The egg hatches internally, but then they give birth to a live uh, offspring. And these are referred to as the ovoviviparous uh, uh, species as you see here. One uh, other little nuance is 
There have been several documented incidents in various aquaria, including the Drury Aquarium in uh, Omaha, Omaha there, where female sharks have given birth without the assistance of any male. And it's been documented by, through DNA analysis that there was no other DNA involved. It's a phenomenon called parenthogenesis that had not been seen uh, in, in sharks. It has been seen in some insects and et cetera. And uh, it's, it's very interesting just how uh, adaptable uh, these critters can be. Uh, they also uh, have redefined rough sex as well. Here's uh, an image from the Tennessee Aquarium in Chattanooga of uh, two sand tigers uh, literally getting ready to do it. Uh, because they don't have hands uh, to do so, the male will latch on usually to the pectoral fin, uh, not in this case, it's not, not the case, uh, in order to grasp and insert the clasper, which is the penis-like organ, it'll insert, insert into the cloaca. Uh, as a result, most species of sharks, the females have skin that's far, far thicker than the males. The other little nuance in uh, at least in this one species, this is the sand tiger again. This is an ovoviviparous uh, species. Now sharks have two uh, uh, utera and therefore they are uh, producing eggs in each. The little guy first is the winner. And this is the winning uh, fetus. Uh, and what he's doing is eating any other brother or sister who may have been who <laughs> may have been born after him. Uh, it's referred to as interuterine cannibalism uh, or adelotrophy. Uh, and so he'll consume not only what uh, any other uh, lesser developed shark, but also the female will continue to. Uh, produce eggs, which it will consume as well. Little nuance there as well. So that's uh, that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to discuss in terms of uh, any content, but I did want to give you a couple other insights. Uh, there's a wonderful podcast called Beyond Jaws, uh, and I would encourage you to uh, take a listen. Uh, they've uh, it's It's just a it's done by shark experts who interview other shark experts and people who work in the field of sharks. So if you are into sharks, absolutely list, give a listen. Uh, and secondly, there are a couple of new publications. The one on the left from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization is the best field guide I've ever seen uh, to Caribbean sharks and rays. Uh, it's free, it's a free download. And uh, I would encourage you, if, if of interest, that uh, that's a good one to have. And brand spanking new off the press is this uh, in the uh, li Lives of Series Sharks, which is a, a spectacular uh, book looking at a wide range of sharks and their habitats. So I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. Okay. I'll take some questions uh, at the end, but before I, I wanted to kind of conclude with a, a quick discussion of uh, the Galapagos. You see the trips upcoming uh, there. A little bit of orientation as to where they are. They're about 600 miles uh, off the coast of uh, Ecuador. They're part of Ecuador. A couple of things. These are remarkable islands because they happen to have a, a marriage, as I, as I say, between geology and oceanography that really no other place on earth has. Uh, as a result, if I can get my cursor here, they're influenced by three different currents. We have the cold Peruvian uh, Humboldt current coming up this way. You've got the warm Panama current coming this way you have the South Equatorial Current. And believe it or not, there is a current deeper, hundreds of feet below the Pacific, coming from we uh, west to east, called the uh, Cromwell Current, or the uh, the Equatorial Sub uh, uh, Countercurrent. 
and it hits these islands and comes up up well so you have all of these current dynamics which change over the course of the year which has impact on diving as we'll talk about and so it's quite unique in that regard secondly they've been uninhabited they they it, it took until the early 19th century for people to really live on these islands so they've been undisturbed for a long time and fortunately the ecuadorian government has really implemented a very effective um uh, uh, public uh, marine management uh, MPA marine protected area here. Likewise, you see that they sit at the juncture of a couple of different continental plates, and what's happening beneath here is the magma is coming up very very close to the crust in what's referred to as a hot spot. Now. Hotspots are the you know represent really the newest uh, land because what's happening in the image you see here, this magma plume is able to punch up and really come close and sometimes uh, uh, up through the crust. Uh, Hotspots are responsible for the islands of Hawaii uh, and Iceland. And if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, that is a terrestrial uh, hotspot uh, that has been uh, that has created that caldera, uh, which is very geothermically ac active. If you've ever been there, the Galapagos therefore are pretty young; they're only fifty million years. In fact, Fernandina is less than a million years old, uh, so they really, really are new in terms of Earth features. The consequence in terms of our interest in terms of, of, of diving is uh, these are these are challenging diving conditions and all of the operators and everyone who's experienced with the Galapagos advises that these are locations that you really should have some experience because uh, the visibility isn't always good. Uh, the temperatures are cool to cold, depending upon your definition for quote, tropical diving. Remember, these islands are on the equator and you would expect similar conditions to, you know, Tahiti or Indonesia or whatever. And that's not the case due to this confluence of different uh, uh, ocean currents of different temperatures. And you kind of see there that there are seasons where you will tend to see different critters and encounter different uh, kinds of uh, uh, different uh, uh, temperature regiments as well. Uh, as you see at the bottom, the, uh, di the Alert Diver magazine has a wonderful article in the uh, November 2001 edition, and I would encourage you to uh, take a look at that if you're interested in Galapagos diving. I have to tell you, this is a location that I've never been, and it's absolutely on my bucket list. So with that, uh, what we'll do is kind of conclude my discussion here and uh, uh, just make you aware that uh, uh, the uh, December program uh, will be on the 13th. And what I thought I would do is just look back on some of the news stories that we discussed and provide some updates on what's been happening uh, over the course of the year. And then lastly, I know some of you who are watching are dive professionals. Uh, and if you are going to be attending the DEMA show uh, next month, uh, I'll be there. Uh, I'll be in and out of the <coughs> uh, Dive Newswire booth. I'll be uh, at the Reef Smart booth signing uh, my book, the uh, Beneath the Blue Planet. Uh, and I'll be conducting actually two seminars. So uh, please get in touch, touch base. I'd, I'd love to meet you uh, face to face. And with that said, I'm going to turn things back over to... Uh, Sabrina, and, and let her uh, direct any questions that uh, may have come up. All right. Does anyone have any questions? You can send them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask them whatever you feel comfortable with. Hi, I had a question. Um, there was the sharks rubbing on the whale shark earlier, and you said that they were doing that to get rid of parasites. But I mm -hmm. wondered, how does the whale shark protect itself from those parasites? Well, uh, you know, parasites are a huge issue in all fishes. I mean, they, they are fish are are, are replete with uh, with parasites, and ridding them. You may uh, be familiar with cleaning stations with tropical with, uh, with bony fishes, 
Uh, th there are fish, there are cleaners that will service uh, whale sharks. Uh, I don't, you know, it's not like a whale shark has a bigger shark to uh, uh, engage in chafing, so they can't do that. Uh, and to what degree uh, uh, pilot fish or remores remove uh, the parasites, I'm not sure. I would suspect, however, because whale sharks are so so frequently uh, visit tropical locations that there are ample reef fish that you know do all do the number in terms of removing uh, parasites. But that's it's a good question, uh, and all fish uh, have have this problem of of dealing with uh, with parasite removal. Thank you. Sure. I had a question, Alex. Can you kind of expand on the dermidenticals? Would like let's say there's a like a nurse shark, like a benthic species, would they have the same shape of dermidenticals as a great white or some sort of pelagic species? Not, would they have not at all. Not at all. In fact, if I can uh, I will show you the incredible diversity of uh, the dermodenticals here. Get rid of some of this stuff here. Okay, here you see here, these are different dermidenticals from different species. So th there is variation. It makes sense because, you know, if these are, you know, they have different, you know, functions in terms of whether they are primarily assisting in uh, swimming or whether they're assisting in, you know, uh, 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 not allowing, you know, fouling or uh, bacteria to adhere to them. So if there are, uh, there's a wide variation. Pretty interesting. Teeth, for, teeth on your skin. <clears throat> Anything else? Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? You can put them in the chat and I can read them out loud if you don't want to. Yeah, I can't me. believe I was that thorough. By you the way. You were very thorough. Yeah. Uh, chapter, let's see, five. Chapter eight in uh, Beneath the Blue Planet uh, will go into actually much more uh, deal, uh, much more detail than I did here. Uh, but you know, sharks are, are pretty interesting critters. They, uh, you know, for for a vertebrate this size to continually be be discovering new species uh, is pretty unusual. And the fact that they have adapted to every marine ecosystem on the face of the planet, from the surface to the deep ocean, is also pretty remarkable. In that there there appear to be so few species co uh, compared to uh, to bony fishes. All right, we have something in the chat. Let's see. <laughs> we just had someone who said that they would listen to audiobooks read by you all day long. Your voice is excellent. <laughs> okay, I guess I missed my calling. I should have been in a voice a voice <laughs> Well, if there's no more questions, you can also email Alex if you think of any after the webinar is over and he'd be happy to answer them. This webinar is being recorded, so we will have that up on our YouTube channel and then also on our Oceans Update website. So you can go back and watch it and share it with friends. And then all of the references that Alex used are also on our website under our Oceans Update page. So if you want to look into more of those studies, you can find them there. Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in and we hope to see you in December for our last Oceans Update webinar. Thanks guys for, for uh, participating. Hope to see some of you, Dima. Take care. Thank you. Bye everyone.